All right, it's going. I can see the little numbers counting off. That's that's always my indicator. So I'm here with Mud, Uncle Mud. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, rocket mass heater that was put into the red cabin. I believe this is the fifth rocket mass heater to be built in the red cabin. Um, let's see if I can remember. The first one was Minnie Mouse. That got replaced with the Cyclone. I think after that, we did the four inch J tube. Then we yeah. put in the Camara. And now we have a six inch J tube, which is in there now. Yeah, so, that's not right. Yep. Did I forget anything? No, nope, that sounds right. Okay. Um, I do think that the Minnie Mouse that went in there was an early prototype. And when the Minnie Mouse got moved up to the Love Shack, Peter Vandenberg gutted it and then added a lot more mass. And uh, and that helped it. Um, but it was it's experimental. And um, yeah. there are parts of that experiment that we enjoy very much. And there's parts that we don't enjoy very much. Um, but we've since done the Cobb hat on that. And the Cobb hat has, in fact, you and I had a meeting, just a regular old meeting. It wasn't recorded, anything like that. We had a meeting about, I'm going to say, it was, I want to say three years ago, but it might have been only two years ago. It was remember, about two years ago. Yep. I remember it was in the winter. And Magdalene was staying in the love shack. And uh, and she was saying that like she would go to bed and it would be 78. And then she would wake up and it would be 60. And, and I felt like that was too much heat loss through the night. And so there's not enough mass. And so you and I probably spent four or five hours hammering through a whole bunch of crazy ideas. And um, and we ended up with... Try them. That? And then getting her to try them, some of them. <laughs> well, right. And, and, and uh, she was willing to try some and, you know, but but we kept going with the ideas over and over and over and over again. Like, remember the mullet idea? We had an idea we called the mullet. Um, and you still, still want to do the, you still want to do that. But I think the Cobb hat is probably number one. And so finally the boot camp uh, took on the project of putting in a Cobb hat in the Love Shack. And the results have been excellent. Like, like the results are better than I expected. I thought we were, I thought we were going to see some improvement and then we were going to have to do more improvement. Like, because we still had, a, we still have a bunch of ideas to try on that, to improve it even further. Yeah. And so, um, but okay. She was experiencing an 18 degree drop uh at night and that was like when temperatures outside were like uh um 28 or something like a little below freezing and uh on it and that's what that was too much and so i thought the cob hat was going to cut that in half but the cob hat took that down to a drop of 2.2 degrees which i think is amazing mm -hmm. that's yeah, I thought we were going to get it down to like maybe a nine degree drop, but but two point two is just stunning. Okay, so Andreas has put a picture up, and that's that's I think the first pass at it, at the Cobb hat, and and uh, and I saw that, and it's like it's one of those things where it's like uh, you talk about it eight or nine times and then they go up and they 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 build it and then they send a picture like see we built it and it's like okay here's all the things that need to be different from that 
And so I don't know whether I said it wrong or what, but um, uh, I don't. So Andreas, as long as you're putting up pictures, do you have something that's maybe a more recent picture of the cob hat? Oh, there you go. And look, there's Magdalene who did the initial test. So there's there's what we ended up with. And and it's like, um, so, uh, you know what? I, I want to sit here and spend hours talking about the cob hat, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. So no, how about if I... How about if I stop talking about the cob hat? <laughs> and even, even though I'm going to bring it up again here in a moment, but we're going to talk about the red cabin, the, the rocket mass heater and the red cabin. And so it's it's rocket mass heater number five in there. And it's because we do so much experimentation. It's so the um mini mouse was in there, it did it did fine, it did okay. Um the cyclone was in there, it did. It did okay in some ways, but it was unacceptable in some ways. And and we took it out. And I believe, if I remember correctly, Uncle Mud, uh, you are angry at me because we took that out because you loved it so. Am I close? Mm, I I was angry until I got to uh, deal with the uh, large soot deposits inside of it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and then it, and it was it was and and it was and then I was just sad because it's beautiful, but it um and it was and it was brilliantly functional in certain circumstances, which is not good enough. Yeah, we were pouring a lot of time and the modifications. Mm -hmm. Oh, like, and people you know, were uh, were in, in doing uh, Josiah did laparca stock laparoscopic surgery on the back of it <laughs> <laughs> replaced yeah. its entire intestines yeah that no that that we we it it was given every opportunity uh and uh and ultimately there wasn't enough draw uh, uh reliably there wasn't enough draw to uh uh to keep it from uh sooting up no creosote but a lot of a lot of soot because it just wasn't drawing I had I had like five more ideas on things that we could try, yeah. To carry it through, but but the bottom line is is that if we tried all five things and all five worked well, then it's still I I think it would still fall short in ways, and it and it's a design issue. I mean, it's beautiful, but it's like. Um, this is this is the cyclone would be excellent for somebody where it's their only rocket mass heater and they've got four years of experience getting it to sing for them. It's right. like trying to get somebody to play the violin well the first time they've ever played a violin. Is that yep? That's yep. I mean that's and that's assuming that we did all the changes to try to get it to work better. So, all right. All right. That was, uh, so that's the second one that was in there. Then we did the, the four inch rocket mass heater and, um, and, and that one worked. Okay. It did. It was, it was sufficiently a rocket mass heater. Um, but it, I, do, I felt like it took too long to get to a clean burn. Like you'd have to, it would be about four or five minutes in until you would see a clean burn and you'd have to do it very well, like lots of small sticks. Um, but mostly the thing that bugged me about the four inch um, is that I couldn't get my hand inside to get the ash out. <laughs> and it's like, sure, we could make a thing that goes down in there to get the ash out and stuff. And but, uh, boy, I just I so I learned that my hand does not fold up into four inches or smaller. Another thing is, is that I think for it to work better, it really needed to be in a sand bath or needed to have the exterior insulated in some way. There needed to be more to it. Um. So we yes. so we got it to the point that it was working okay. 
but um, there wasn't a lot of ways to get it to be magnificent. And I feel like the Red Cabin, while it isn't our most natural building cabin, it is our most centrally located cabin. And everybody, when they want to stay in a cabin, it is the most popular cabin because it's just right in the middle of all the action. And so yeah. everybody wants to stay in the red cabin. And so on top of that, because everybody wants to stay in the red cabin, everybody wants to do their experimental rocket thing in the red cabin. So um, I finally decided I don't want the four inch one anymore. And, uh, uh, and I know that's your creation. And so I, I pooped all over your creation. Um, but I think, I think you'll admit that it, while it was an acceptable performer in the rocket mass heater world, it wasn't glorious. Yeah, we were, we were trying something new there that, uh, um, a, a, a wooden tiny house with a wooden, uh, raised floor uh trying to get mass in there that won't burn the place down and a and a functional rocket uh shrunk down that far um it was a pretty good first go um and then we we tried boosting the size of the riser inside um over four inches to the uh we put the ceramic core in there uh to see if the this uh if that would uh give us the reliability we wanted but uh ultimately um this was pretty good indication that uh four inches it just isn't enough for uh for uh heating uh the space and uh and we're better off uh perfecting a, a six inch or or even an eight inch but we wanted to exhaust that first and uh and also it was nice to to figure out that yes we can do a decent uh feed tube uh on the, a, a proper height feed tube as you would say and uh um and then we insulated it but even with uh two inches of ceramic board insulation that sucker got hot on the outside which meant it wasn't leaving all of the uh uh the heat for the burn um i think when we when we built it the experiment was um there were there were a lot of people in the rocket mass heater world that said four inch rocket mass heaters just don't work and don't just don't do it but if this is such a tiny house kind of tiny space tiny 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 um, I felt like, I, f I felt like, um, there was, there was a possibility we could get a four inch to work. And I think we could, right. we did, we got it to work. Yeah. Um, oh, however, you know what? There, there wasn't enough heat left at the end of the run. I mean, there, there was no heat left, uh, partway into the mass um we uh one of the things we wanted to see was whether a four inch could produce enough heat to run this system and uh and uh that you know that fifteen thousand btus or fifteen thousand btus we were putting out uh we were absorbing all of it in our pebble mass so yeah, yeah it's we, we we weren't drawing even with a <laughs> a really gangly looking uh, four inch uh, chimney popping out of the top of the the roof. Um, you know, with the, the just too much friction compared to uh, amount of heat produced. Yeah. I think another big thing is, is that, and this is where the, the Gamera, which was the next one kind of fell, failed also for this space. This is a cabin. Yeah. And so a, a cabin is going to start off stone cold and you got, 
you got all all the stuff because like the that foreign system would have done perfectly fine inside of a of a tiny house where somebody lived there year round. I mean, once it's once it's warm inside, like if it's 70 inside or 60 inside and it's 20 outside, it would have performed really well, exactly as built. Um, but we had a problem and that is that uh, when it's stone cold and we need to warm the cabin up enough, warm up the mass enough because somebody is arriving. Yeah. It just, it took too long. And part of that's because the wood feed is so tiny. Now yep. um, we, we replaced it with the Gamera and the Gamera uh, had the same issue. Um, uh, it was like it, the Gamera does great at keeping a space warm, just like the four inch system did great. Now the Gamera, this Gamera was a little bit bigger. It took a little bit more wood, but still it, we, it just wasn't. And when we, when somebody stays in the red cabin and they don't have experience with rocket mass heaters. I kind of want it to be easy and delightful for them and very effective for them. And that's yes. kind of what we're talking about today. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to get to the final thing that's there. But the great thing is about we put in a standard six inch J tube rocket mass heater. Now, I want to point out that the Fisher Price house. Uh, while it's technically built to be an eight inch system, the wood feed has been shrunk down to be basically the same size of wood feed as a six inch as, as what what's built here. What you see in this picture, a six inch J tube rocket mass heater. So we can't put uh, the amount of fuel that we put in here uh, in the Fisher price house is about the same as the amount of fuel that gets put into uh, the red cabin. So, um, uh, it's like, uh, it should be cause we, you know, in fact, here we are, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's February right now. And, um, and yesterday the temperatures were hovering around the twenties and we didn't even build a fire yesterday. We just kind of coasted and then, uh, built a fire. Today. So having a fire every other day, um, or, you know, so anyway, in this small space, this six inch rocket mass heater, I, I think should be able to get to the point that if somebody's staying in there, a half hour fire each day will be plenty to keep that space warm. So I, I, I got a, there's, there's so much to talk about. So, um, all right. The Gamera is gone. The Gamera, we took it out. It just it just took too long to bring the space up to temperature initially. Right. So, now, this one, I mean, that one of the things you're doing, so one of the things that you did with the four inch system and you've done with many of the systems that you've built here, many of the rocket mass heaters you've built here, is you kind of have this habit now of you build um, the block. What do, you, what do you call it? The heat block? I call it the, the, the burn block. The burn block. Okay. So you've got this burn block, which is basically a bunch of fire brick wrapped in some kind of metal to hold the fire brick together. And, um, and you kind of cut the fire brick to an exact size, which I think you did this for the rocket oven initially, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. And that's, and we have video of that, and it's in the Rocket Oven movie. Yeah. But you've improved on it and polished it over the years. And I know that I've now looked at the video clip of you working on this many times now for uh, this project, for the for the Red well, Cabin project. It, 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 it does, uh, you know, I can see how you'd watch it over and over. Because I'm edit helping with the editing process. <laughs> well, I, you can call it what you want, but you know, <laughs> I, I, know like, I know you like watching that shit, that clip. Oh, yeah. I see, I see, I see. 
So uh, everybody, everybody is. Uh, so we're we're recording this with the idea that this we're going to have some summary notes uh, to go with the build, and um, so I have a. a a list of things I want to, I want to talk about. First thing I, I think is important to say, I think that the first riser that went in this, Oh, you know what I should say is we took lots of video of this as we were building it. And a lot of people came out and a lot of people, the, the enthusiasm and the excitement was powerful. Um, and it had to do with the fact that, um, uh, Europe was in trouble and they were going to need heat. And we thought we would build a simple, quick rocket mass heater, take video of it, post it to YouTube and share it with the world so that they could see a good, simple, clean build of a rocket mass heater. And then everything went sideways. Uh, you know, step one, um, there the problems of Europe were solved by selling them natural gas at a price 10 times greater than what they were paying before. And the government just yeah. made the difference. And instead of uh, them uh, using rocket mass heaters, whereas if they were in a pickle, I think rocket mass heaters would have looked mighty good to those folks. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. The great news is, is that uh, a, a video came out from a guy in Scotland talking about how he built his rocket mass heater and how it has been a dream. And um, so that's, I don't know, there's, I'm, I'm an American trying to help Europeans. And it's like, what the hell do I know? But there's an actual European who already built one and it's been great. Um, well, so we, and this, we had this, this particular rocket heater, uh, we went to uh, some, uh, to, to pains to, uh, to try to build it without using uh, a bunch of expensive uh, ceramic uh, uh, fiberboard, uh, and uh, and you know, have something that would work uh, basically with with very minimal resources, and 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 it work in a tiny house, and 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 it's it's really uh, nice how well it's come this way. We pushed some boundaries. And on top of that, we were trying to do three projects simultaneously, <laughs> and uh, which meant that each project, and we didn't have like, we didn't have like forty people here. We had like um, less than a dozen, I think. And so, um, everything progressed slowly. Uh, it would have would have gone much faster if we had more people. Um, but we made the best of it. In and the, the end, people who were there were fantastic. Yeah. That is true. That is true. They, they were they were really terrific. Um, you can see all those people in the... We're, we're going to try to get all the video up on, on YouTube, but uh, we'll have a drawn-out, boring version available for sale, uh, Freaky Cheap Heat, um, uh, as well. But... Um, I think uh, talking about the design of this. So first up, I think that the riser that was built was possibly the best riser for people. Like, like we should, we should take the build of that initial riser and just make a YouTube video about that. And then say, this is probably the riser that 80% of people are going to build. This is this is probably the best riser. Like, look at this as a default. Start here. Because previously, the default that we used almost universally was the uh, moldable ceramic fiber tube. But that, just the tube alone was like 400 bucks 10 years ago. I imagine it's over a thousand dollars now, and so it's kind of like okay, that's prohibitive for folk. And at the same time, I kind of feel like the the riser that was built during you know for this build 
um, which it, we ended up taking out for reasons. We'll get into that. Um, that I think is, is like, that should be the default for everybody. Like, look at this and there could be some simpler ways to do it. Um, but that was an excellent riser. And so it's got a fire brick interior, but rather than just stacked fire bricks, it was carefully shaped. I mean, was it an octagon? Is that? Mm, I think we had a hexagon. I think that okay. was all we had room for. So it was well shaped. It was, it was well, I, I kind of think it would be great if somebody could say, Oh, do you want a six inch riser? We will sell you the fire brick. That'll be the stack that you'll use inside of that. And uh, now you'll have this really excellent riser, but cause not everybody has a, uh, the saws that I have for a shaping right. bricks like that. And, uh, um, but I think it ended up very, so it's, it's fire brick interior. And I think it's it, they're halves, right? Fire brick Split. halves. Yep. Yep. Splits. Splits. yep. And then it's, it's wrapped in, I believe two layers of the, um, super wool. I think mm. only, only bit. room for one layer. Yep. Okay. It one was, layer. But, but that, that's all it really needed. It's been pretty fantastic. And then it had a uh, duct on the outside. Like maybe it was eight inch duct on the outside uh, to hold the super wool and pinch the super wool onto the fire brick. Yep. Um, I'm going to guess that the total cost of all the materials for making that is somewhere in the range of 140 bucks. Oh, there it is. There's a picture yeah. of it. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, he wasn't supposed to show the picture, this picture, because it had duct tape on it. Paul they, doesn't they, like duct. Yeah, I'm. I'm sure you pulled the duct tape off before, like as you wrapped it. Please tell me yeah, you pulled that off. I, I, I think you'd like to be assured that the duct tape was pulled off. Yes. <laughs> oh no. All right. Don't build it with duct tape, people. Okay, so I mean, you could put some duct tape on it to hold it in place until yeah, you get the rest bit. of it there. It, it'll, it, 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 it'll burn off just fine or, or take it off as you go up, but it makes a huge difference in holding it, being able to hold it together. But uh, yeah, the. Uh, off. Please remove it before you heat it. You'll uh, love that duct tape smell. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, stone. Okay, people, don't, don't put. <laughs> oh. Okay. All right. Moving on. Moving on. Th there are better. Riser, ways. Yeah. That riser was amazing. That riser was awesome. And uh and that's that should be like that should be the default of what we look at today. Like, okay, you can because basically everything we are doing is to try to come up with a cheaper version than that ceramic fiber molded tube. You know, cheaper, so cheaper, and and also we still have concerns that are unresolved about the ceramic fibers uh, going into the air. Um, really? You know, it's not as bad. Yeah, and yeah, we we should be slightly concerned about that. I and think we're not. I think it's fair to be concerned, but for mm -hmm. me, it's like when when I've been running some blazing hot fires. And then I pop the barrel off the one in the Fisher Price house and I look down inside of there and it looks brand new. I'm thinking like that's not putting anything into the atmosphere. So I feel I feel like this degree of testing that we are doing, which is granted yeah. anecdotal, it yep. is it is very much mitigating my concerns. Right. All right. Right. Um, but fire brick, fire brick in the internal liner is very nice uh, for mitigating those concerns and for lower expense and for uh, uh, being able to 
uh, fix something when it cracks and be able to do it uh, cheaply um, from materials that are pretty much available everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I'm going to guess materials cost for that riser 140 bucks. What do you think? My clothes? What's your guess? Uh, depends on what fire brick costs you. If you're 140 bucks, uh, about if you're if you if fire brick is is uh, four or five dollars around you, uh, I'm lucky I can get fire brick for mm, twenty uh, for two bucks a piece or less. Um, the uh, yeah, the main expense is time. That that's so, uh, that's an expensive uh 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 riser in terms of time but not in terms of materials so and for you a lot more a lot more durable also well under 100 bucks is what yep. i heard you just say okay all right yep. i and that's a big part of why i think this is this should be the default for all the things i mean we wrote that risers ebook i don't uh so a lot of people have read the Riser's ebook now. What? Can you not hear me? You're making a weird bud. What? Andreas, can you hear me? Oh. Yes. Okay, mud, can are you are you trying to say that you cannot hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, excellent. Yeah, let me. All right. Let me get some volume okay. up there. Now, okay. so we 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 built it, uh, and um, the draw was poor. But here's the beautiful thing about a six-inch J tube. We 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 did some gambles. We. We thought let's let's demonstrate tiny house stuff. So we used a 16 gallon barrel, which is a really small barrel. And um, in the end, I think it proved to be way too small. We just couldn't get a good draw going. It right. it, it worked. It worked. Oh not even okay really um if we got it really hot it would then seem to work all right but it would take us a long time to get it really hot and so as and so then in the end we decided we gotta so first thing we did is we thought we'll keep that smaller barrel but we'll switch out we we found that we had a six inch tube oh yeah there's the book the risers book i think that the risers book i think i feel proud of the risers book i think it's a very good book i think i think just and it's only like 40 pages or something like that i think that by reading the risers book you get such an excellent understanding of so much stuff that you are thoroughly prepared to to build a rocket mass heater I think it, and it has our latest and greatest. And on top of that, we had some of the greats in rocket mass heater stuff come and, and read the book and put their own commentary in the book. So um, I, I really like that collaborative style that we did with it. Okay. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to want to add this riser to that book at some point. Yes. Oh, good call. Good call. Um, and so we replaced it. We, we found that we had a, a six inch molded ceramic fiber tube. And so we put that in there thinking that that was going to fix everything because it would have a smaller outer diameter. So it would allow more gases to pass through. And of course, since it's our premium type of riser then the whole thing is if that's the problem the whole thing's now going to work really great and it helped it made it better but not better enough 
So uh, right. then we switched to a uh, a 35 gallon barrel, which really fixed everything. So then stainless steel, and it was stainless steel, so it throws off less heat uh, during the burn uh, uh, than a mild steel, but. That means that more heat goes into the mass and more heat goes to the vertical exhaust, which kind of brings us to our conversation today. Because at the very end, Stephen did a test. He, uh, he started off at 50 degrees and in 51 minutes, he got it up to 68 and then he went to bed and in the morning he woke up and it was eight degrees cooler. And it's like, okay, there you go. Done. Mission accomplished. It burns clean. He went out multiple times during the test, during the burn, to, to get video of the exhaust. And the exhaust was very clean for the whole burn. And it's kind of like, that's, that's a solid win all the way through. And so... Um, and today we are recording this thing because I want to talk about how I want even more. And, and this gets into the space of, I don't know, I, I think there might be people that are interested. Maybe people are sick to death of hearing, uh, hearing us talk about rocket mass heaters. But um, I'm obsessed and bonkers about this. And so I want to talk about what's next for this rocket mass heater and um step one is i i want to list what i want just for general want and um so while we gained 18 degrees in 51 minutes with steven's test while it was a little below freezing outside um and that is that is good I would like us to be able to gain 18 degrees in 30 minutes or even faster. And so uh, could we do it in 25 minutes? And now granted, this is it, it has successfully taken on its, its primary function, which is to heat a cabin, which is to go from stone cold to comfortable heat. And so, is it something that can be done in half an hour? Um, and before we were running a fire in there for several hours trying to get it up to a comfortable temperature. And it's like, this is not okay. And so we, we got to replace this. So now we got it under an hour. We can get to a reasonable temperature. And I'm just thinking like, I'd love it if we can go in there and if we do a 45 minute burn, it's like over 75 in there. And so that way, when somebody arrives to the cabin and it's very warm, then they'll be like, wow, this is awesome. This is terrific. This is this rocket mass heater that is really the awesome thing. So that's, that's what I want to have happen. And I, and I kind of feel like, all right, so, Let's do some tweaking to optimize this rocket mass heater. So I want to be able to heat that space, heat the overall space faster. That's, that's one thing I want. The next thing I want is that it lost eight degrees overnight. I'd like to get that down to four, which we now know is going to be easy because of our uh, the, the Cobb hat experiments up at uh, the Love Shack. So I'd like to I'd like to get um, so with with the way it is now we lost eight degrees overnight. I'd like to get that down to four or less. Um, I'd like to get a generally a stronger draw. The draw right now is pretty strong, but I'd like to get it to be much stronger. I'd like to have better cold plug resilience. So um, currently there is 
cold plug resilience systems in place. So uh, just to, to let everybody know, um, the Achilles heel of a rocket mass heater, you get all this efficiency. You can heat a space with one-tenth the wood, but the trade-off is the cold plug. <clears throat> now, granted, other wood-burning contraptions had cold plug problems too, but um, rocket mass heaters are especially vulnerable to cold plug. So what happens is if the temperature outside is the same as the temperature inside, which is going to always be the case in a cabin that's gone stone cold, then um, it's difficult to get a rocket mass heater started. All that efficiency gets in the way. So um, it currently has... So, I don't want to get into specific of, of what to change. I want to talk about what I want. I want better cold plug resilience. I want it. What's what's there now is acceptable, and I want it to be better. All right, those are the those are the four things I want. So, Mud, do you have any other additional wants in this? So. Uh, I thought of one more. I want uh, easier priming. Which and that be, that's the same as the better cold plug resilience, or is it different? Yeah, uh, I guess it's a, a a way to deal with the cold plusing resistance. You also mentioned wanting to get rid of the uh, the shiny metal on the wall. Exactly. That's the that's the one I just thought yep, of. Yep. I want the whole just... thing to be more handsome. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So the uh, um, I uh, of all of those things, I I would also like to um, do the same uh riser to try the same riser with even less expensive material like uh like to not have to use the ceramic wool to back it up with insul uh to have an insulated riser because I, I like that internal lining of of fire brick um uh I'd, I'd like it to uh uh to be easily insulated with you know ash or or a perlite or vermiculite, whatever you've got around. So uh, continuing the strategy of making it more available to more people, uh, I'd like to be using less of the, the high-end materials. Um, and uh, the, uh, and you know, one of the things we didn't mention much was the, uh, the, uh, the sand bath around this uh, heater that, uh, um, does both insulating the core and also uh, uh, storing a little and releasing a little heat. Um, not, so not just insulation. Um, uh, that also uses Adobe and sand as its box, which is as utterly available as you possibly can get um, and uh, for, for cheap. So, uh, uh, and and also works with a tiny house um these are a lot of things that that we've been able to do with this already and uh, uh and if i were to uh be talking about what else can we do uh i i would say let's let's push that envelope more how can we get the high uh the the uh the high efficiency the high performance um using less of the uh of the high uh environmental footprint uh products to do so and and maybe you know build something that that's a little bit faster to build uh and uh, than than this one was that uh that lovely uh riser uh just took a lot of cutting um so so yeah these those are the things making it more accessible in design uh is uh, uh is to me uh the next thing uh i don't care if it takes longer to heat up in fact i'd rather it took longer to heat up because i'm of a strong opinion that 
most of the failures of tiny house uh, rocket heaters uh, come from uh, people simply getting warm enough, quick enough that they don't <laughs> keep firing the, the rocket heater long enough for it to charge up the mass and keep them warm and they wake up cold and they complain. So, so that, uh, that's, that's one of the things I'd like to see as well is to, is, is just to make it work better as a tiny house heater uh, by optimizing what people are going to be likely to do with it to match the circumstances of waking up warm. I, I, so I, the reason why we're recording this now, because most of the stuff mm -hmm. that we do, either we agree or one of us is kind of like, sure, whatever, you know, and, and <laughs> we'll let it go. And, uh, and so, but on this one, we've got a couple of things where we're not agreeing. And so we're going to record yeah. this podcast so we can get our kind of, kind of get our notes in while it's still relatively fresh. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and I want to, you, you bring up the idea of like, how do we get this riser cost down even further and how do we make the build of the riser even simpler? And my mind starts spinning and I, I think I came up with an idea and it goes like this. First of all, yeah, do a square riser that's made out of splits. So you've got your uh, fire brick riser. Then um, you're going to do uh, like an inch of cob around it, but it might be, maybe it's just cob, maybe it's cob with vermiculite, or I'm sorry, with perlite. And, um, but, but maybe it's just cob because cob that's, that is freaky cheap. It's free for us because we just use clay and sand found on site here. Right. Um, right out of the dirt. And so, so you get, you give it this wrap of like maybe three quarters of an inch thick of some fairly nice cobby kind of stuff around that fire brick. And then you kind of make a little bit of a cobby bowl at the bottom. And then you're going to take your metal duct and slide it over all of that and then fill it with sand. Okay, so that's just a thought I had. But the thing mm -hmm. is, is that the moment that you're moving away from that 16 gallon barrel, mm -hmm. also known as a 120 pound grease can, you can you can make your risers fatter. And I think that's kind of part of if you want to go cheaper then make the riser fatter. And, um, and so I kind of feel a, like yeah, to do there. Yeah. So we, we couldn't, didn't have the room for a 50 gallon drum and we could not for love or money, get a 35 gallon drum, which would have made the whole thing much simpler. We ended up with these 16 gallon drums that we really had to squeeze. And ultimately we squeezed too far. There wasn't enough room for a good uh, for for a good exhaust path in there with a 35 gallon drum there's enough room and uh and we can have a square exhaust and we can put a little uh a little pipe around it and fill that with ash before it would you know we don't have to have vermiculite or anything there's all sorts of pl uh, fun things we can do uh cheaper but with a tiny house, there's just not room for a 50 gallon drum. If you can find a 35 gallon drum, uh, hold on to it and don't tell anybody you've got it um, for your tiny house um, because uh, that's that, that's a really sweet spot. The the 15, the 20, the 16, the 20 gallon uh, grease drums, um, you end up having to use like a five minute riser in there because there's just not room for anything else. Um, and, and, and we, we go back to other, other issues with the five minute riser then. Um, I, but yeah, I want to share a thing, which maybe I shouldn't share, but I'm going to share it anyway. It goes like this. Somebody heard about this project 
and and that somebody is um, has access to barrels, a lot of barrels that they sell. They they sell barrels. Yeah. And and so they gave us a 35 gallon barrel because we're special. A stainless steel 35 gallon barrel they gave us, which is like. If you go buy a new stainless steel thirty-five gallon dollar a gallon barrel, you're talking four hundred for a used one. I've seen them for six or eight hundred for a new one. But if it's sitting around dented, they they get it, they get scrap value for them, and they were kind enough to ship it to us and uh, and and let us play. And, yeah, uh, and, and it made my, a huge. Difference. My impression is is that they did this. Because they want to start selling barrels to people that want to build rocket mass heaters. So part of me is kind of thinking that, all right, this is working. It's working awesome. And I'm grateful. I'm so grateful. I want to plug them. But I kind of get the feeling they're not ready to be plugged just yet. Nope. And so maybe this fall. Um, you know, the fall of 2024, maybe by then they'll have a website put together and they'll be ready to sell these barrels. Cause I'm kind of getting the feeling that while well, you're right, while it's $400 <laughs> to get this weird sized barrel, my guess is that, that they might make a couple hundred just for rocket mass heater folk. And then people might be able to get them for, I don't know, maybe a hundred bucks, including shipping. I just guessed. I have no idea. Yeah. If you can get uh, your local, you know, make friends with your local barrel guy um, because, uh, uh, or, or people, because there's, um, uh, if you can get a barrel that doesn't have the paint on it already, or even better, a barrel that's being recycled where they've already taken the paint off for you using a much more environmentally friendly method than even the wrap it in clay newspaper and burn it method. Um, it'll save you a lot of time and headache um, and and you'll get a cheap barrel. Um, and if you say, hey, watch your watch your stash for us, or, uh, or in this case, this is a custom barrel company. They make all sorts of weird things for all sorts of people and i can say watch your stash and and sell me something you were going to sell for scrap prices anyway uh or i can say make me something really nice you want a copper barrel make me a copper barrel um because i want that patina i mean i'm Did imagining that? that would be yeah yeah it would be probably very expensive but uh but it would be gorgeous it would be absolutely gorgeous um, I would I don't think copper would work for our needs, would it? Yeah. I, I mean, what at what temperature does copper melt? Mm. See, I think I it melts remember. fairly low. All right, let's set that aside for a moment, <laughs> um, and let's let's because we get we can get into the weeds a little too easy. I've uh, been there, done that. I think another thing I want to talk about is is that if you're going to try to have better cold plug resilience. One of the strategies is, is like if you're in a cabin and you're going to do cold plug, because like you don't have to worry about this if you're in a house. You just don't ever have cold plug resilience problems, cold plug issues. Um, and so uh, you don't have to, so it's really only for cabins and shops, TP, any place that's going to get stone cold in the middle of winter, and then you got to start it up. Like if you have to start up from stone cold more than once a year, you need to design your system for that. And um, I'd say that the number one thing to do is to make the whole system less efficient. So that way, when you start a brand new fire, and then it puts a bunch of heat into the mass. The mass is inefficient. So more heat goes into the vertical exhaust, which helps you to kind of get things started. So so how a cold plug always kind of happens like this. You start the fire. Everything seems to be running fine. And about two to three minutes into the burn, suddenly the smoke is not going the correct way and it's coming out of the wood feed. 
And if the smoke ever comes out of the wood feed, the, the whole design is shit. Like your design sucks if you ever get smoke coming out of the wood feed. Ever. So, I mean, the one exception could be if it's a cold plug and you didn't take the steps to mitigate the cold plug. Like, you know you're starting cold. And then you got, ah, oh, crap. Now, I also got to say, I've had smoke come out of the wood feed in the Fisher Price house, but it, but it was because the house is sealed tight and somebody's <laughs> running the kitchen fan at full blast. So now as the, so what's happening is, is that the air that goes into the kitchen fan is coming out of the rocket mass heater. Everything's running backwards in the rocket mass heater. And it's, you know, and so it's like, okay, we got to at least turn the fan off while I try to start the rocket mass heater. And, and you would think, oh, no one would ever make that mistake. And it's like, who's got two thumbs and has made that mistake four times? this guy <laughs> so uh it it happens <laughs> so it's like why is it going the wrong way and then it's like oh that's ah shit so turn off the fan and then suddenly it goes the right way magic okay so the when when so so general strategy make your Make your mass less efficient. And um, I know that we wanted to do an experiment here where when we put the, the duct in, so it's got the over and back duct, um, but we did do eight inch over and back duct. And one of the things that I think is a great idea is that we take a big rock and then we kind of glue it to the top of the duct with cob. Um, and the people putting it in there got a little carried away. So they, yeah, there's a picture. And it's like, they kind of made this big cob mass over it. Uh, it happened to have a lot of rocks in it. And I was thinking about one tenth of that amount of cob, just kind of glue some big rocks to the top. But what they did was so efficient. I think it was, I'm going to say that for a cabin, for a home, that's remarkable. That is brilliant. That's good stuff. That's a good design right there. But for a cabin and you got to, you got to mitigate cold plugs. I think, I think that the, I think our cold plug mitigation would work better if there was less cob right there. So the cob is more efficient than pebble style. At the, at the same time, it's so efficient, it's taking out. So when you very first start the fire, it is very efficiently extracting a lot of heat from the, uh, from the first pass of, of hot gases. So that very little hot gases are making it to the vertical exhaust. And we're not establishing a real strong draw and at the beginning. Yep. So, okay. so here's where this video is going to be interesting in a couple of uh, uh, months or years when we look back at it, because I'm, I'm going to disagree with you on this. Uh, I feel like the only reason or the major reason that we ended up with not waking up cold is from having more efficient uh, uh, capture in the uh, in the thermal mass, and that if we give that up for the sake of easier starting, then people are going to wake up cold. And and I so I like keeping uh, a very efficient thermal mass and building a better priming port, um, and we'll. Uh, and you know, with the experiments we go on, run on this uh, in the next few iterations, uh, we'll find out uh, uh, which one of us uh, owes the other a huckleberry pie. <laughs> and and that should be another podcast to talk about how I don't believe either of us are probably going to eat any huckleberry pie in the next couple of years. But that's another story for another day. Um. 
I think both of us are looking mighty thin right now uh, compared to a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. But, yep. you know, all right. We're back to Rocket our- Mass Back to rocket mass heaters. So this is an area where you and I disagree, and this disagreement is delicious. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, and uh, either either one of these will work. This is working great, and you know, and yeah. we're what we're going to see is what will work better next. True, and this is the system where we can we can do things. We can make changes. We can yeah. optimize this. Whereas the previous four builds, it was like, uh, can't even optimize with this. Can't, I mean, like we could optimize the previous builds, but we could only go so far. Whereas what we have right now, we have, we have oodles of room for optimization. Right. So this is this, this ability to, to optimize as needed is a thing which i think is the beauty of the jtube it's like uh the whole jtube design in general still has mountains of room for optimization and it's so simple um and and i i truly believe that that the the standard jtube builds these are going to be the thing that transform the world because they are so easy to build and uh, so cheap to build and so quick to build. Um, it's like, this is, this is what's going to make, this is what's going to take over the world. Batch box is wonderful in the right conditions, but you know, you got to generally expect it's, it's a much more sophisticated build and, Anyway, that's another conversation for another day. All right. Digging into this. The cob hat. I I what I want to do is I want to make our existing system less efficient, which means there will be more heat going up the vertical exhaust. So it'll make for a much stronger draw in the system overall which means less heat will be captured in the system. So the whole system will become less efficient at holding on to heat. But I kind of feel like this is something that's important to me when you're in a cabin. So to help mitigate the the cold starts. So, um, but I kind of feel like if we put a wonderful cob hat on here, then we're going to have the benefit of the existing mass plus the benefit of the cob hat. But if I could just make the system a little less efficient in other places, then we'll get a stronger draw and it'll come at the cost of sending more heat out the roof. Now, um, so I so we've got the cob hat put in up at the love shack it's working great and we've already come up with a bunch of thoughts on if we could you know optimize that and so if we're going to build a cob hat in the red cabin which i can't help but think that at the ptj this year that'll probably be a project i can't help but think that that there that that there'll be a there'll be eight people here at the ptj that want to build that um want to move these experiments forward. So on the image that Andreas is showing us right now, we originally said we better make this first cob hat have kind of a pointed head. Otherwise people will set shit on it. <laughs> and and then you know it could get too hot. So and, and it goes like this. The hottest point of a rocket mass heater is the top of that barrel, the cherry on top. And uh, people have recorded temperatures of like 1,100 degrees at the cherry on different systems. And it's like, okay, that's a lot of radiant and convective heat. And it's all, the radiant heat is hitting the ceiling. And the ceiling does get extremely warm. 
because it's a flat surface. And so it just does this radiation beam straight to the ceiling. Then your ceiling gets too hot. And then on top of that, a lot of the heat just manages to go out the roof at that point. So you're losing too much heat because the heat differential at that point is too extreme. So a lot of that heat is going outside. And it's like, that's not good. Plus, it adds to the stratification of the temperatures inside the building. So you get a lot of heat up close to the ceiling where it isn't doing anybody any good, except it's leaking out more there because now the temperature up next to the ceiling in general might be something like 110 degrees. Whereas, you know, we haven't even hit 70 down at our feet yet. And so it's kind of like, okay, the, the, the hat, the cob hat, it doesn't touch the top of the barrel. There's a gap. And we've kind of said like the gap needs to be big enough so you can cook a lasagna in there if you wanted to. But there's a, so there's a gap between the cob and the top of the barrel. So now the radiant heat hits the cob and the cob absorbs that heat. And, uh, and then, so, and this originally came from you. You said mm -hmm. in your designs of the cottage rocket, and I'm going to say six years ago, seven years ago, you were telling me about the cottage rocket. And you were saying like, rather than having a mass bench, you could put this cob blob on top of the barrel. Of course, don't have it touch the barrel. That would be bad. But um, you could put it above the barrel. And then rather than heating your, your bench up to like 120 degrees, you could heat this thing up to 400 degrees. And then there's less of it. So it works better in tiny houses or in places where weight can be an issue. And, uh, but it heats up to a much higher temperature and then carries that through the next day. And it, it works. And the, there, there's a number of aspects that we can look at and, um, and, you know, point at it working and say, uh, entirely different things about why we think it's working. And, um, the, and when we initially started sticking stuff on top to try to capture some of that heat before it hit the ceiling, we put some big chunks of, of your local rock on there. Um, and, and said, okay, we're going to warm those up. We're going to cook those on top of the heat of this, uh, the barrel and, and see if those will help us uh, stay warm overnight. And what we found pretty quickly was that the smaller chunks of rock, even a big pile of small chunks of rock, um, uh, would absorb a heat and then radiate it out again pretty fast. And then we would get the biggest chunks up there that anybody could lift up there and try to stick them close together. And then the top chunks, wouldn't be nearly as warm as the bottom chunks because thermally they weren't really connected. Um, and the, the heat was all being absorbed by the bottom chunks. And the bigger chunks on the bottom were helping us stay a little warmer. Uh, that was promising. And we said, well, why don't we sculpt something with Cobb up there? And, um, uh, and, and the, um, the concern that you have for the, uh, the metal of the top of the barrel uh, led to conversations about how to have that hat absorb the heat, but not uh, trap heat there and make that the top of the barrel too hot for um, for the metal in there to have because the metal will spall as it gets hotter. And uh, personally, I, I you know they call me Uncle Mud because I do everything I can with cob, and I would just use the top of the barrel as a uh, to cast a piece of cob and stick it up there and and then chuck the barrel lid someplace else because the cob can withstand that direct force and we can absorb 600 and 700 degrees temperatures rather than 
the the radiant heat from the outside of the barrel that can make that uh that hat work better um i think uh uh yeah i love it uh i, I love it in fact the the cottage rocket initial design was to uh was also to wrap some cob around the um uh the riser inside and uh it didn't uh we didn't have insulation inside the riser like we should have so it wasn't uh it wasn't as optimal of a burn as it could be will will we improve that since then but having that the uh the the barrel full of cob as full of cob as possible uh has has uh, i mean i heat i heated my um uh my my fisher price house uh for three years uh with just a uh, a cottage rocket a barrel full of cob um uh rocket heater uh no other insulation around the riser nothing nothing else it's just cob with hollow spaces for the for the riser and the tubes going down um so we could uh and then cob on top of that uh that hollow space where the uh the air where there were the exhaust comes out of the riser and on top of that manifold where it goes back down um the more oh, especially in a tiny house situation the more of the heat we can keep in the system uh past the uh, uh you know we want a little bit of instant gratification heat so that whoever is feeding it will continue to feed it uh it'll get a little warmer uh and and warm up the space uh so they're not frustrated but um but the more of that heat the stored in mass rather than just let off into the ceiling and into the air up high in the room um uh, uh one of our cottage rocket designs actually has a, a hollow metal manifold underneath the the burn chamber uh the, so the exhaust has to go down through there and radiate heat down at foot level uh before it goes off into the thermal mass bench or whatever uh but but keeping uh, having a mass around our uh, our barrel, having that hat, as, uh, or um, if we design an airflow up and around to protect the metal, uh, we can actually. I like the idea of a, of, a, of a mullet, a cob mullet on here, where we got airflow coming up underneath this mullet toupee, uh, kind of protecting the back of the of of the uh, the barrel. Uh, so that heat that's been radiating into the wall is all just kind of being trapped in the air that gets sucked up and under the, the, the hat and comes out the front through that nice little slit that you guys have built in there. Um, and you just get pushed into the room where you're gonna, uh, where, where, you, where it's going to be more available to you. Um, and maybe we even go as far as, uh, as having the intake for the air that that comes up and cools the top of the barrel at the bottom of the far corner of the room so the coldest air in the room gets sucked up over that uh uh, uh over the top of the barrel and out into the room um yeah we keep more heat in the system further um even being willing to send some up the chimney um but trap more in the mass uh and uh uh and give us uh, a a good draft um uh without warming the space up too fast so that people stop feeding the fire so you said something about making a cob blob and then putting and replacing the barrel top with the cob blob yeah and i've got I've got two big objections to that. Having never tried it before, this is just me being a whiner. <laughs> okay. Objection number one. In order for that cob blob to hold heat long enough, we're talking about something in the realm of 160 pounds to 300 pounds. That's a big ass blob to move. But my <laughs> second objection is that um, for most of the system, once once it's running, the whole thing goes pressure negative, except right. right at that point 
you know, except for in the riser and just above the riser, that's a that's a fairly high pressure system because it's going to push up the riser, then push down the barrel. And so mm -hmm. that's a spot where if you don't get a really great seal, things could be yucky. And uh, I, I, that makes me nervous as hell, especially when you start talking about, well, once we heat this up, which we're going to heat it up a lot, these different materials are going to, you know, expand and contract at different rates. And, uh, and it's like, so the opportunity for leaky bits, uh, including leaky bits months down the road, forming makes me nervous. And so I, I'm having, now I have a third bit to add to all this. We've done the cob hat where we keep the metal and then we've got that gap in there and we've got two pieces of angle iron in there. So you can put the lasagna on the angle iron. So it's not sitting right on the barrel, thus causing it to potentially spall. But you could put a lasagna in there or cookies or pie or... All, kinds All of, of which things. are very compelling arguments. Lasagna and cookies and pie. Absolutely. There you go. There you go. The list goes on. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I kind of I kind of feel like, well, we haven't tested that function yet. It's ready to be tested. And um, and I'm very excited about it. I think I think it's gonna be a big win. And so um I, I kind of feel like um, this way you maintain the seal and at the same time you can bake things in there if you want. And if you don't want, that's fine too. Everything is, I mean, clearly the results right now are spectacular. Absolutely. So Absolutely. for the one in the red cabin, I'm kind of thinking like, okay, you know, I've got my vague want, want, wants, my vague wants. And I want to be able to get the temp, the cabin up to temperature faster. So basically my, my general theory is I want to burn the same amount of wood, maybe even more wood in about half the time in order to get the cabin to heat up faster. And this will also mitigate the uh, the cold plug uh, issue. There's not really an issue right now, but I'd like to make it so that it's, it's, it's easier. It's more delightful. I, I want to improve the probability that somebody can stay in there and the experience is five times better um, and uh, just vague betteritude. Um, you know, if they go and they try and start the fire, but they didn't read the directions, chances are it'll be a little wonky, but it won't be as wonky. Um, uh, when they try to warm it up the first time, if they happen to do that, it they have a greater success. It, it, it warms up warms up much faster. If they want to maintain heat, so they want to get up in the morning and it's still quite warm, and when they come back the following evening, it's still rather warm, and then they can start a new fire. I want I want all of these things to be even more delightful than what's in there right now. And I've got all this stuff in my head about how we can make that happen now that we've got a baseline. And so which is what this whole conversation is about. All right. Yeah. And that leads to cob hat. I think a big part of the, my recipe is, is that, okay, if I can get the heat over to the vertical exhaust faster, it'll have a stronger draw. And with a stronger draw, it'll burn that wood faster. It'll move heat into the system faster. It'll put mm -hmm. more heat to the existing mass faster, and uh, it'll and then the mass will absorb more heat because it's it's so efficient right now, and so it's it's like okay, 
and I'll end up with more heat getting to the vertical exhaust. So it's kind of like, all right. By doing that, by getting the whole system to go faster and putting more heat outside, then, um, and at the same time, wanting there, because you're a bit, you're talking about how you, you want the mass to be as efficient as it is. You're very happy with how efficient the mass is at harvesting the heat. And I'm kind of mm -hmm. thinking like, okay, I want to have, I want to do even better. And we can with a cob hat. Let's, mm -hmm. let's build a better cob hat than what's inside the love shack. And by better, I mean, let's make it thicker on the top, more mass. And let's make the top flat. And now I've been saying, let's make the sides of the cob hat vertical. And and you have a different philosophy, which is so the uh, whatever direction the surface of our uh, radiant warm thing is is facing is the is what's going to get warm. So if I have a triangular warm thing then the warmth is generally going to be focused in those three areas square thing four areas and there's going to be these points where there's not so much radiant heat going out a circular round thing is going to radiate fairly, fairly evenly a dome shaped round thing is actually going to radiate up as well as it radiates to the sides i'm saying if we had a radiant surface that even was a little bit uh, uh, sloping out, a little bit conical out, so that it's radiating at the floor at the other end of the room. That's going to be where you know you're sitting at your desk uh, at the other end of the room, and you're getting some radiant heat down around your legs. Um, the it's not just the bench that is the the thermal mass in. Uh, building um, the whole uh, the whole um, uh, Fisher Price house is the thermal mass that keeps the room the the building warm through the night between firings. Uh, not just the that uh, not just the the mass bench and in a little room in a little tiny house. Um, uh, every bit of mass that absorbs heat slowly releasing it contributes to how long you're comfortable. And, um, uh, and, and if we can radiate heat at low masses where it's going to keep our feet warm and, and it's going to have a farther path, more difficulty leaving the building, that heat will have more difficult path leaving the building. We're, we're going to be happier. Um, I would even consider uh, building uh a a mass a, a cob hat that had slanty sides and and some insulation on top of it so that it was really not very warm up there but this mass is radiating into the room longer because it has a less radiant surface but it's radiating down and out into the room uh and and even um if you've got that nice air circulation coming up uh, under the cob hat, under un, uh, and and out the front, uh, maybe it gathers more uh, more heat from a, a cape or the the mullet, as I'm saying, in the back where we don't want heat radiated. We don't want heat radiated at the wall. We want heat radiated out at us. Oh no! Looks like uh, your internet may have died again. <clears throat> so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to to um, let's pick. gather as much of and send as. Okay. You hear me now? I can hear you now. You 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 kind of went offline there for a sec, but all right. I do think that everything you're saying is true. I I also think that. The uh, the temperatures we're talking about here are something in the range of like 150, and so this 150 degree thing putting out radiant heat, it is putting out radiant heat. It's just not an enormous amount, but basically it's like you know having this 
12 hours of this small amount, it does make a difference. And it's, yeah. and it's amazing how it accumulates in certain places. And so then you, you get up in the morning, you put your feet on the floor and you're, you're like, the floor is warm, you know, and, and this is what would cause it. So, all right. Um, that is, it, it, that is a worthy experiment. I'm not sure about putting something insulated on the top, but uh, maybe. And so, but the thing is, is that I think other than that, we're agreeing that this Absolutely. shape go with this design of Cobb hat. That's, that's on, that's up there in the love shack only yeah. uh, bigger. So thicker, thicker mass, um, either vertical sides or a little bit, you know, uh, like really wide at the top coming down to a narrower, narrower at the barrel. Um, and, and it's like, I, I, I could see that. I mean, we might need to round that edge a little bit so it doesn't just chip yep. off, but. Yep. Um, and we can talk later about the, um, about uh, the, the barrel, you know, Cobb and the barrel, but most of the oldest rocket heaters were built with barrels that were old with big rust holes in them and that rust was patched with cob. Um, I, I seal a lot of the places where there are cracks between the joints of the barrel and the lid with a little bit of, uh, so we definitely have um, to, uh, um, to seal uh, those surfaces but uh, you know the the there's there's a lot that we can do with the uh uh with this design uh, that we're agreeing on for a cob hat uh to make make this work better in a tiny house the the one thing i'll be curious to see uh to see whether it diminishes our returns is um the uh the stainless barrel has about one fifth of the radiant of the radiance of the energy transmission of a um uh, of a uh, a mild steel barrel so already our our stainless steel barrel is radiating very slowly into the room compared to what a mild steel b b uh, barrel would be doing so i will be very curious to see if our um if our results from our our hat uh, uh, do everything we were hoping, or, or if they're uh, milder results because we're not getting as much radiation off the barrel already on purpose. I I I think that there's a lot there's a lot to to contemplate there. I do think that when when we're talking about a temperature, like when we're recording a temperature off of the uh the top of a of a steel barrel at 1100 and then when i go to a stainless steel barrel and i'm getting temperatures of a thousand then i'm kind of thinking that it's like conductivity probably changes when it gets much hotter right and because if nothing else if the if the temperature is well if the temperature gets to 1600, it'll, the, the steel, the mild steel will start to spall and the stainless steel mm -hmm. will not. So right. it's like, clearly these temperatures are these, these tests about uh, conducting heat are probably done at, at lower temperatures. But I, I, well, I wonder the if will eventually get, the heat will eventually get out. So if it's, uh, you know, if we're if we're cooking with uh, if if we're cooking along with a good hot rocket fire, um, and uh, it's uh, a and, and it's it's fifteen hundred degrees on the inside, it's it's eventually going to approach that on the outside, even if there's a lot less conductivity because the 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 heat will be transferred through eventually. But if the heat is transferred through slow slower we'll have a lower temperature on the outside compared to what's on the inside. We, we're already getting a bit of that thing that we like of 
of having more heat left over to go through the rest of the system into our mass and then up our chimney to make things work better for the tiny house. We're already getting more of that with the stainless than we are with the uh, um, with the mild. Um, I'll be very curious to see um, how much we're getting of that and and, and how much the improvement is. Uh, how much improvement is made by putting uh, the, the the cob hat on? Will it be like uh, putting another hat on on top of a hat, or will it be uh, uh, putting another hat on top of a very poor hat? So we're 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 able to see how much happier we are. That's a very good point. Um, at the same time, as I'm going through my wish list. Uh, you know, I've got the thing where it's like, okay, I want to have a stronger draw, which means I have to give up some efficiency. And, uh, but I think I can get that efficiency back and then some by adding a cob hat. It might not perform as well as in the Love Shack. But then again, we're going to make a better cob hat. And so, it, yeah, I'm kind of hopeful that it'll perform better but it's also i think that the i think that the red cabin is about 40 percent. it has 40 percent more cubic feet than the love shack but the love shack's also a four inch rocket mass heater whereas this is a six inch so right. uh and also this has like already it has a big mass and so we're gonna you we're gonna lean on that mass and add in the cob hat as a mass so I'm I'm kind of thinking like this overall recipe that I'm working towards here um, is going to get me all the things that I want. It'll heat the cabin in less time, so you'll get up to your initial temperature faster. Uh, it'll have an overall stronger draw. The um, the cold start stuff will be mitigated. The cold plug stuff will be mitigated, um, and uh, and will carry more heat through till morning. All of them. And it's like, uh, and I think a big part of that recipe is going to be to put in a cob hat. Um, yep. I I think that uh, uh, as long as we're on the topic of like, how do we make the system less efficient? Well, one way would be to make the um, the mass thirty percent smaller, but that's a lot of work, and I don't want to do that. Another would be to take out maybe 60% of the cob that's inside of the mass. But that also sounds like a lot of work. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it go. I think that um, a good way is going to be like right now the stratification, the juice box straw going down into the stratification chamber, I think it's got a good eight inches. It's going down eight inches right now is a guess and you're nodding so my guess is confirmed i'm gonna say let's take it to four and and now the whole system will be less efficient and then and that's a little bit sad but it'll make it so that um, we get a much stronger draw and so we'll be able to heat that space faster but with the same amount of wood. <clears throat> so um, that's that's my current plan to make the system less efficient for the sake of being able to mitigate cold plug stuff, um, as well as being able to have a, a stronger draw so that way we can heat the space faster. So it'll use the same amount of wood, but because there's so much more air blowing on that wood, it'll burn faster. All right, next up, um, in order to help mitigate cold plugs, there is a critically important ingredient missing from this build. And it's, and it's one of those things where everybody says, oh yeah, that person will take care of it. And then they're pointing back at the first person saying that person will take care of it. And, and then, you know, together, if they ever got together and shared notes and realized that, you know, nobody was going to do it, they would point to future people. All oh, the future people will do it. Let's not worry about it. Let's focus on, because it's the most boring part. And that is that I, I, 
there's not currently a sign there that gives people instructions on a cold start. And so we got to have that. That is, I think, so important. That makes all the difference. Having that sign, it just transforms the whole thing by having a proper sign describing how to do a cold start. So, now, uh, so if we had a sign that said how to do a cold start and it included how to use the um, the priming port that we haven't talked about installing yet, there's that's where I would start. Well, and I think cold start instructions have to mention that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's part of it. And there has to be a port to be able to prime the vertical exhaust, which the current one has a port to prime the vertical exhaust. It's just not great. It, it's, it, it's weak. We, we moved it so that we could to put it, and we put our... Um, uh, we we put our juice box there instead, and uh, and you and I did some you know, design charrette around that as to uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, as to how can we put a uh, a, a really good um, a priming port in there that would also act as a clean out, um, and uh, uh, and that right there might mean that we don't have to make the mass any less uh, efficient, um, we just get the the, the uh, exhaust good and hot uh, before firing, um, put good instructions up for that. Uh, and then the, uh, uh, and then when we fire it, um, it's, it's rocketing very nicely and absorbing and uh, slowly releasing uh, more heat in the cob hat and uh, more heat in the um, uh, in the, uh, uh, the, in the mass bench. Um, and if it's absorbing and releasing more heat from both of those places well enough, then, uh, then we don't have to fire the heater as long, which would be also delightful. So I think that the clean out port needs to be removed and then, um, replaced with another clean out port that is about 11 inches closer to the vertical exhaust. And it makes it easier to um, uh, prime the vertical exhaust. That's, that's my thinking at the moment. Um, and uh, so that's, that's, that's one component to help make it, it, it's like it won't change much other than just making it, making the priming of the vertical exhaust easier. There, you can kind of see it in this picture that Andreas has put up. There's that priming port, which is also a clean out that is on the far end of this picture. And, uh, and it's like, let's just come up with a way to get it to be much, much closer to that uh, vertical exhaust. And then uh, yeah. that'll, yeah. Um, now, now, one of the retrofits that, that we talked about um, is you know, putting in a T in there. In this case, we might have trouble finding a spot that's easily accessible at the base of the, uh, the vertical exhaust, which is the best place to put a, uh, a priming port. But uh, we, we talked about a, uh, a T with a cap and that cap has a little uh a little uh uh support on it for uh for your bernie bits to to uh you can pop the cap off and uh and stuff some uh some uh, uh flammable stuff into this little holder that's that's part of the cap and you light that and shove it back in there and it's just sitting there inside of there, giving a uh, giving us our uh, our um, uh, our our prime. Uh, if we can't get to the bottom of it of the uh, the exhaust, so we'll we'll have to see which which one works better for us. I'm now on to my last note for this for improving this rocket mass heater, and and this is about making this rocket mass heater 
more handsome, in my opinion, and and more handsome. I think that the heat shield is not particularly handsome. And we use the heat shields a lot to be safe and they are wise and they're good engineering, but it's at the same time, it's like, uh, um, and, and you know, this is what conventional wood stove should be doing too, but they do other things and, uh, uh, or they don't do anything at all, which is kind of like, that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, there we go. This here's a picture. It's even got a finger pointing at the heat shield. <laughs> That's handy. So, uh, I think that that heat shield is ugly. And, um, and so at the same time, I'd like to be able to make it so that when the fire is burning, I'd like to have a stronger draw, especially in the first two minutes to help con to, to help mitigate cold plugs. And so I've kind of got this idea of what if we kind of made a, um, a bit of cob that kind of would touch the vertical exhaust and touch the barrel in such a way that there was an air gap that went between the vertical exhaust and the barrel, but was surrounded by cob and capped at the top. And part of what I'm thinking is, is that as the barrel starts to heat up and it puts out 200 degrees at the beginning, then that 200 degrees gets kind of held in this capped air pocket, which in turn heats the vertical exhaust. And then as the temperature goes up and up and up and up and up, then the vertical exhaust temperature goes up and up and up and up and up. And it, it creates a stronger draw. And then beyond that, the cob can be expanded in such a way to be a bit of what we've been calling a cape, which is just cob touching the barrel. And so the idea is, is that it'll heat the cob. So if we put something on that's three inches thick, that's touching the barrel. And by touching the barrel, I mean, within two weeks, there will be a third of an inch gap between the cob and the barrel because the, the cob will have dried and shrunk and, and other things will have happened. And so there's going to be this gap between the, the, the cob and the barrel. And so, um, but it'll be a, th it'll still be three inches thick and it'll probably be about four inches away from the wooden wall. And I think that the hottest point on the outside of that cob, so like the outside of the barrel is going to have spots that are probably going to be something on the order of 400 degrees at the top of the barrel. I'm just guessing 400, 440, somewhere around there. That'll be the, the hottest we will ever see on the top part of a barrel on a six inch system that is stainless steel. That's a guess. And then the cob is going to absorb a lot of that and spread that out. And so I think that the hottest point on the outside of the cob is going to be something on the order of 130 degrees. And then as it radiates that 130 degrees out towards the wood, the wood will be heated to something on the order of 95 degrees which 95 degrees is less than a 105 degree day. Therefore, I think that that wood will now be so safe that we will no longer need the heat shield. Now, of course, the thing to do is we build it and then we test it and we kind of get an idea of like, is it safe? Did it fall within what we thought? Is it off by a little bit? Is it off by a lot? Things like that. Absolutely needs testing. Absolutely. Yeah. 
I, I, uh, I, I will. Um, the uh, most of the actual rocket heaters that I have seen cause um, uh, cause uh, building fires uh, have been because wood was too close to a mass bit, not even the barrel bit, but a mass bit that uh, that built up heat over time. So it's, you know, it's negative 20 out. So people are firing the thing 24 hours a day, sleeping on the mass, things like uh, sleeping on the mass bench and firing it, things like that. Um, uh, so I, I tend to be, uh, and also it was places where that mass um, made it hard to check for heat buildup. Uh, between the wood and the mass, and also over time, the uh, you know, the the continued uh, exposure to heat made the wood more flammable at a lower temperature. Until one day, ten years later, boom! Uh, I'm this is this is a very small set of of uh, of of actual happenings because there are so few. Um, uh, 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 building fires that have happened because of rocket heaters, uh, um, but it it has me concerned, and I will be very happy uh, to be testing this to see uh, if we can use less shiny metal and use more cob uh, for uh, functional heat shields. Um, I mean, I've used. I've used pea gravel as a functional heat shield, um, and uh, I, I'm uh, the, and so I know that there are uh, other ways to 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 get uh, to slow down the heat other than reflecting that radiation. But those uh, uh, but those those sheet metal uh, heat shields are extremely effective, and so we're going to have a um, we're going to have our work cut out for us to to uh, see if we can do something different. So I'm trying to imagine a mass being heated to a temperature high enough, because my understanding is, is that if you expose wood to a temperature of like it's 140 degrees on the wood, and you can do that for years, eventually the wood um, will ignite. But it's got to be 140 or better, spread out over years and years and years and years. Yep. And so, in order for a mass to be able to be hot enough that it will radiate out a temperature that would hit that wood at 140 degrees, that mass has got to be at a temperature of like something like 220 is a guess. Yep, and that yep. would have to mean that, like, there's a there's an exhaust manifold right there, nope. and the amount of no, no, no. What if the uh, the the mistake was that 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 generates this type of stuff is thinking uh, is that that if you're if you're building your um uh you're building your uh your your heater. And installing um, uh, the the J tube in a, a mass of cob, and you've got six eight inches of cob below your your manifold, below your your below anything with flowing exhaust. You're thinking, well, that's far enough away. Uh, but um, what will happen is that that uh, J tube gets mighty hot and um eventually it gets uh um uh i mean because that j-tube is is over a thousand degrees hopefully and yeah. uh and and um the bottom of that firebox which is you know six eight twelve inches away from uh the wooden floor um is slowly and surely building up that that heat to the 
uh, in all directions, including straight down. And what happens is that <laughs> the bottom side of the wooden floor catches on fire. Okay, but, but you just said it was the mass. It was the mass. So, so, so it so was not our, the mass. Our cob, um, uh, our, our cob hat, and our uh and any mass that touches our radiant barrel is subject to that kind of temperature any so and yeah. and will not cool down quickly like a like a sh piece of sheet metal will so the the, the, the constant heat will concentrate and cause fires yeah uh, using and if this is true of brick or stone or you know, anything massive, not, I'm not talking about the mass bench. I'm talking about anything massive being in close proximity to the high temperature that we're talking about. So, so you were, so the, the, the problem where you saw flamage or, or something went bad with a rocket yep. massacre, it was wood that wasn't protected from the burn tunnel. It, from it, yeah it was not because i was because i thought i heard you say the mass and i was thinking like that's something beyond the manifold no nope, nope, there's multiple beyond places. the manifold you've never seen a problem so beyond you know yeah when you get to the mass bench uh it can still be 300 degrees within that mass and under that mass and and that can lead to a problem but the uh but but any place uh, within that's uh, any any mass that is within a foot of the uh, the the burn chamber and any mass that is touching most of uh, any mass touching our um, our uh, our radiant barrel has has a has the capability of getting to fairly high temperatures. Um, and, uh, and, and the, the, and if we're, um, and if we're going to, uh, use mass as a, as a, uh, um, uh, a thermal break, uh, so that we're not radiating directly at wood, we need to be very careful that, that, that mass doesn't allow heat to build up and cause us the problem. Now, if there's an air chamber, there's, if there's an air passage between, the radiant barrel and also air passage that where the the hot the air gets warmed up and gets moved out and cool air has to come up and replace it on the outside of our uh of our uh uh cob um uh radiant barrier uh yeah we're probably going to be just fine but we need to be uh we need to have data uh from you know firing for a long time before we uh and not building up heat from being in close proximity uh, before we go and uh, and uh, and and put that in a in a uh, tiny house. So uh, I think that the amount of heat that comes off the barrel is enough to heat the wood above 140 degrees. Yes. Um, and then if we slap three inches of cob on the side of the barrel, then I, I kind of feel like what's going to be on the outside of that cob after, if you ran that thing 20 hours straight, what's going to be on the outside of that cob is going to be something on the order of 250 tops. Probably. I mean, if you do a one hour burn, I'm kind of thinking like maybe it'll get up to 180 you know and so and then if it's if it's 180 and it's radiating out that 180 the wood which is going to be about four inches away is probably going to be hovering around uh 95 or so and so i'm i'm kind of thinking like um it's not going to be an enormous amount of heat. And it's, it's something where it's like this barrier will mitigate it. Now, of course, if you do only an inch thick of cob, it's going to be much hotter. And, and it's, 
but I, 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 I'm kind of thinking about like, okay, much hotter. What if we do a, an hour burn or a two hour burn and measure the temperature of the wood and see how we did. Um, right. But with three inches of cob, I'm thinking like, if we forget to measure it, I think I'm going to be okay. I think we've got so much buffer. I think we're going to be all right, but I could be wrong too. Well, and that's, that's where we want to find out because the, uh, if the three inches of cob is, um, close enough to our, uh, our, our very hot radiant surfaces that it concentrates heat, uh, that outside of that cob, um, can be, you know, three or 400 degrees eventually, uh, for now. And we're not talking a one or two hour burn. That's, that's, that's not really, uh, a concern. The, uh, the places where, where I've seen, uh, things that worry me, uh, uh, is, is, you know, when it's, when people are just running the thing straight out for, uh, for, um, uh, just cause it's negative 20 outside and their house was, you know, poorly insulated, um, because that happens a lot. And, right. um, so, so what we was, that's kind of, kind of where we have to design for is where, where the Gilligan factor is going to show up catast catastrophically um and not where not where it's probably uh gonna be okay um and uh um so so i'll be i this is this is a test that i will be excited to to see the results of uh to see uh, how uh what can we do with with these materials um to not have sheet metal hanging on the wall um and uh and you know where's the limit of of what what uh what will work well the other thing is is that if you, if you take out that sheet metal heat heat shield yeah and then you you put in this cob cape we've been calling it a cape so it's just mm -hmm. on that it's just between the barrel and the wall so the barrel is currently heating that heat shield which then you know the heat goes up straight up from the heat shield and so instead it would heat this cob that this cob cape and then um, the cob cape will help in carrying heat through the night. And so, and, uh, and, yeah. And the, and if the cob cape is, is brought up as a as an air um, as an air conduit at the top and at the bottom to uh, to to draw air across our uh, radiant barrel and out into the front of the room out in front of the heater into the room underneath our our um uh, our cob hat um that's gonna that's gonna be putting heat where we want it so my bladder says our our recording today is done <laughs> <laughs> it's sending strong messages right now if you Tell like how this you really feel thing, if you like this sort of thing come on out to the forums at permies.com where we talk about rocket mass heaters homesteading, and permaculture all the time.